our cells are dying and being replaced all the time. An average human cell has a lifespan of three months. If we account for the different rates of metabolism for various kinds of cells, your body replaces itself every seven years. Um, that is to say, you are biologically another person every seven years. Well, that sounds a little creepy. Um, yes, you are still the person on your identity card, but you are just not the way you were anymore. So let's try to go back to seven years ago. How old were you? What were you doing? And what were your dreams? Well, when thinking about seven years ago, the very first thing that comes to my mind is actually the bitter smell of herbal medicine. Because I was probably playing my uncle's little clinic, observing him uh, making prescriptions, having acupunctures, and giving shots to the patients. So when I got back home, I would like find a discarded sofa. And you know what sofa is made of, right? With all of the sponge popping out. Um, and literally give shots to the sofa until uh, it became a fountain of water. Um, and in the past seven years, I have been thinking about being a doctor because I believe maybe giving shots was the only thing a doctor needed to do. My ideology has been shaped, has been reshaped, but something remains. For example, the neurons in your brain are among the, are among the things that wouldn't change a lot. They wouldn't be the, like, oh, oh, this place is making me crazy. I will just move to the stomach or intestine or whatever. They'll stay there because they're storing your memory and personality that you have to carry on throughout your whole life. And as for me, the thing that barely changed is probably my passion for life sciences. And that was also the reason why after seven years, I flew to Cornell University uh, that was 10,000 kilometers away from my home and do a little bit research about neurobiology. So before I came to Cornell, I, I was thinking about I could do something like really fancy. I, I talked to my professor, Dr. Hoy, and he said I would be doing something with the brain and music. I thought I would be doing uh, things like virtual reality and electronic piano synthesizers, but this is only what I imagine, and this is what I got. A little piece of fancy technology. And actually, the creepy thing, the creepy thing over here is <laughs> the lack of a cockroach. Uh, so what I actually got to do was incredibly basic, is to measure the nerve conduction velocity of earthworms. So the neurobiology experiment was fun, but I, I knew I wanted to do something with real cool things, like real biotech. So I ended up in the Neuronex Neurotechnology Conference at Cornell as probably the only high school kid among the smartest neuroscientists around the world. In front of me was a really strange but beautiful world. Under the laser scanning microscopy, a rat's neural stem cells glowed green in the dark. And this is the artwork of a technology called optogenetics. So neurons in your brain communicate with each other and they use a language called electricity. They're all using the same language, so if you just want to stimulate one particular type of cells, you, you can't use electricity because it will mess up the whole thing. And the, the good thing about it is that brain is all dark. And if you can just make some of the cells just respond to a little bit of light. That could be phenomenal, and that's the cool thing about optogenetics. So when looking at those pictures, I, I was immediately fascinated with the infinite possibilities within the glimmering neurons, as well as the imaginative and expansive world of biotechnology. Well, to me, the beauty of biotech is not only about its precision, it's probably one of the most powerful tools to tackle the biggest problems of the 21st century. So let's think about it. Let's take cancer. Cancer is one of the biggest problems, right? We can't solve it. Um, so let's take cancer. The, the problem with cancer right now is that for every single therapy, like uh, chemotherapy, 
like radiotherapy or surgery, you name it, there is a potential that it will do more harm than good. The World Cancer Congress is attended by 3,500 top experts in oncology and public health. If you just randomly like, pull out two people, it will be very, very unlikely that they will agree on the best treatment for cancer. So let's suppose we have a guy who's just diagnosed with stage three colon cancer. <laughs> Sorry, bro. Uh, and we just throw him in a hospital. What would happen? Well, first, he'll spend on average $90,000 to get him treated properly, according to the National Cancer Institute. And second, he'll experience a lot of pain, a lot of vomiting, because chemotherapy and radiotherapy are nonspecific meaning that they not only kill his cancer cells, but also his healthy cells as well. And next, he only has a chance of, you know, 50% to survive the next five years. And even if the guy is lucky enough, it's still unlikely that, that he will survive to the next 10 years. So what's wrong with all these? What if we just throw away all of the traditional formulas for treating cancer? Let's get back to the beginning. So uh, this is the colon of the poor guy, and this is um, the cancer that we're worried about. The thing is that if you just aggressively apply drugs to the cancer, it will soon become tolerant, meaning that the cells will respond to whatever medicine you're giving them. So, can we just change our mindset a little bit? If we can't kill the cancer cells, can we make them kill themselves? Well, you may think this sounds insane, but theoretically, there's indeed a way to do it. Cells do commit suicide <laughs> through a process called programmed cell death, um, P, uh, programmed cell death, uh, which is PCD, right? Um, that is controlled by a set of proteins. So imagine, if we can just play around with those proteins, it could be really funny to see how the cancer cells automatically die, right? Um, and the next issue is that, can we kill like, only the cancer cells, not the healthy cells? That, that's not what we're, we're going to do. Um, let's have a try. So there's something in the cancer cell that's um, pretty special. It's called telomerase. So what, what telomerase does is basically to enable the cancer cells to like, grow to infinity grow indefinitely. It's basically the identity card of cancer cell. If you see a telomerase, you know it's a bad cell. So what we can do is to give it a switch and attach that switch onto the protein so that the protein can only be activated in a cancer cell, not the normal cell. That's not what we want. So now we can actually pack those genes of the protein as well as the switch into probiotics, a type of bacteria that can be used to make yogurt, and actually make, make it a yogurt and let the patient drink the yogurt and everything's solved. What do you think? Well, you may, you may think that this is too unrealistic, right? I'm too imaginative. But let me tell you, as a team of Jenna Foreign Language School students, we actually carried out the whole thing in a lab at Shannon University, and this is what we got. We made the yogurt. <laughs> and we, we even tested whether the proteins can actually kill the cancer cells, and they did. As you can see in these four pictures, they seem to be brighter than the first two ones, right? That's because the cancer cells are dying. That's what we want. Well, you may say, oh, this happens only in the lab, or it just cannot be applied to reality. But what I want to say is that every day in reality, scientists are doing exactly the same thing as we are talking about right now. With biotechnology, they have been able to tackle Alzheimer's disease, plastic pollution, and even starvation in Africa by making crops more nutritious. I hope you've already got the feeling that a biology is like a mirror. If you just look at the world through this mirror, everything has its logic and solutions behind it, right? So yesterday I was looking at the news saying that a mayor in Alabama said something like, oh, there's no way to fix the homosexuality issue uh, without killing them out. 
well, this guy is quite hilarious, but he really got me to think about whether there's any other ways, um, things other than hate comments, for us to address the social stereotypes. What about we, we can use biotech? So last year, when I was volunteering for PFLAG, a nonprofit organization for the LGBTQ plus community, I started to think about whether we can use biology as a way to approach social injustices um, and it basically empower the homosexual people in China. Um, and one day I saw research like this. Um, so I think this team is really ingenious. Uh, what they did was very, very simple. Let me explain it to you. So basically they used a technology called positron emission tomography, or PET. They basically just scanned the brains of both homosexual and heterosexual people. And they scanned a structure called amygdala, basically the emotion control center of the brain. And what they found is really fascinating. So they found that the gay brains are structured like those of the opposite sex. Let's take an example. Um, as you can see in the third column, it's the homosexual man's brain. As you can see, it's structured in a way that is very similar to the brains of the heterosexual women's brain, the second column. And additionally, the homosexual women's brain, as you can see in the fourth column, is structured in a way that is very similar to the first column, the, first, uh, the, the heterosexual men's brain. And I, I found this really fascinating, and it sparked my curiosity. So after that, I contacted a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, and just asked if he wanted to mentor my research in neurobiology of homosexuality. And he agreed. So in a literature review, I found that the gender is quite flexible, not only in humans, but also in many other vertebrates. Let's take rodents. So in one of the interesting researches, the experimenters basically just cut off a structure of the rodent. It's called MOE, a sensory organ of the rodent. And what followed was really funny. <laughs> so the, the male rodent, um, after receiving the surgery, behaved like he, he's, a, he's a mother. Like, he would start to take care of the baby, he would uh, attack the invaders, all of the things he just didn't care as a father. So I hypothesized that maybe the gender switch mechanism enables us to perform roles as both a male and a female. Well, imagine, if every one of us can be both a father and a mother, I, I know it sounds a little thrilling, but uh, imagine, it can be a huge evolutionary advantage, right? Because you can't take care of the baby, and so babies can't have a better survival, and many, of, many, many of them will survive and reproduce, right? So in short, don't think of biotech as something like an emotionless machine. Think of it as a handy, elegant tool. If we can use this tool ethically and responsibly, we are able to turn ourselves into critical thinkers, inform decision makers, and doctors who not only give shots, but also find cures for diseases, social injustices, and the humanity. Thank you.